there's at least six or seven different systems that we're consolidating into HubSpot. So if you think of it like a dam, a water dam, right? And you're like, oh, well, there's a hole and then here's a hole. And at some point you have all your fingers and you're like, oh, I should probably come up with a better overall solution so that there's, I don't even need to be here anymore. Welcome to RevOps Champions, a podcast designed for revenue professionals looking to advance sales and marketing initiatives through the role of RevOps within their organizations. In each episode, we feature leaders who are leveraging technology to drive operational efficiency, revenue, and improve the customer experience. Listen in and learn how to become a better RevOps leader within your own organization. Let's get started. Hello and welcome to another episode of RevOps Champions, a podcast for leaders of organizations with a mission, who know, believe, and invest in technology systems to streamline their operations in order to help them scale more efficiently, in order to better serve their stakeholders and make it easier to scale and grow. I know some of you will be surprised that my guest today is the founder and president of a nonprofit, but nonprofits want to scale and grow too. My name is Brendan Denable, and my guest today is Rob Williams of Every Meal, an amazing organization that is growing like crazy. Listen in, no matter what type of org or business you're working on scaling. I'm very excited today to have Rob Williams from Every Meal with you. So, Rob, my, my first question is, uh, I'd like you to tell me um, every, the Every Meal story and if there was one particular event that sparked the the start of of every meal and 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 please go back as as far as you'd like <laughs> uh well thanks for having me it's fun to be here um the the sort of key key moment that i that i remember and that i like to share with people is uh this was back in 2010 um every every meal didn't exist yet it wasn't it wasn't an idea we had no idea to do anything like this. And the principal at Sheridan Elementary School, which is the school we started at here in Northeast Minneapolis, um, came and said to us, uh, me and another another guy from the church I was actually I actually attend, and said that the kids at our school are taking extra food at lunch on Fridays. Um, they're sort of you know sneaking food into their pockets. They are also having behavior issues leading up to the weekends. And then um, on Mondays, they're just kind of sluggish until they get some nutrition in the system. And the principal turned to us and she said, I talked to these kids and they don't have food on the weekends. That's that's the issue. So they're, they're facing this instability leading up to the weekend, which is causing those behavior issues. And then you know, then obviously that's why they're taking foods. So they have something to eat on the weekends. Mm -hmm. And then they're sluggish because they don't have nutrition in their system on Mondays um, from the lack of nutrition over the weekend. And she said, is there anything you can do to help these kids in my school? Right. And for me, I mean, I don't, how do you say anything other than we'll do something, we'll, we'll try to do something, which is what we said. We didn't know what to do. We didn't have an idea at that moment, but we said, yes, we'll do something, we'll, we'll, figure something out. And essentially we said, well, how about we buy food, put it in bags and give it to kids every, the end of every school week to take home for the weekend. Um, so we started in 2010 with 27 kids at kindergarten at Sheridan Elementary School. So that's how it all began with those 27 kids. Wow. Great. I love that. Uh, but now, so, but if, when you think about it though, something must have prepared you for for being able to step up in that moment. So there's, you know, something that must have happened, you know, in your past or something that, that impacted you growing up at some point that, because, you know, a lot of people get questions like that and are not able to act the same way that you did. So what, yeah. you know, could you share with us if there was something that, that prepared you for that moment? Yeah. Well, I mean, so my background prior to every meal was in logistics. So I worked for an international logistics company. Um, we like to say like, uh, travel agents for freight kind of thing. So moving all the pieces around and getting, you know, everything, this microphone from wherever we, wherever you bought it from overseas, getting it here and, and that kind of thing. So, um, and really that question, as we looked into it more, really became not so much a supply problem 
as far as what the solution was, but more of a distribution problem so or a logistics problem. So there's plenty of food in, in existence in, you know, in Minnesota, in the Twin Cities. It's just that those kids didn't have it in their homes. Um, so the kids that needed it didn't all have that supply of food. But this, it wasn't that there was a lack of supply, it was, it was that it wasn't in the right places. So our solution is really a logistical solution um, where we organize this big network. We have 350 plus sites, uh, schools and sites that we distribute the food out to the kids. And, um, you know, I, I have a warehouse full of food and the, and the trick or the, you know, kind of work effort on it is getting it to the, to the schools or to the sites, to the kids' hands or to, into their backpacks and ultimately into their homes and their bellies. That's the, that's the logistics of getting it, getting it so that those kids can consume it. Right, right. So, you know, so going ahead now, I mean, you've been doing this for over 10 years, right? Yeah, that's crazy. Yep. <laughs> so, 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 I mean, what has changed, you know, from literally the, the very first school at, at Sheridan to where you are now? I mean, how many, how many kids and how many schools are you I impacting today? Yeah, so in 2013, we launched a no the nonprofit sort of separate from the project of the church. And that's when we started working in multiple schools. So um, I'm not going to remember the numbers, but it was something like, you know, the first year it was eight and then 15 and schools. Third, yeah, schools, you know, 40, 100, you know, whatever. And now it's at about 350. Going into next school year, we're actually pushing to, in, to add 200 more schools. So it'll be about 550, 550 schools. Um, and that'll cover about 35 to 40 percent of all the kids in the state of Minnesota will have access to our weekend food program through those 550 schools. And wow. um, I mean, a lot has changed. Uh, the biggest thing probably is I have smarter people working for me than I am, and they know how to do their jobs way better than I do. And you know, they're experts in their fields, our, our leadership team that run our different departments, they're really the knowledgeable ones. And I offer my support to them as best as I can in different ways, um, help spread the word about what we're doing, and, and sh also just share the issue of child hunger, because a lot of people don't, don't know it as an issue, or if they do, they think it's in you know, whatever neighborhood they've kind of deemed as the poor neighborhood. Right. Um, but it's actually in every, every public school in the state of Minnesota has kids facing food insecurity. Really? Yeah. Every school? Mm -hmm. Wow. And the, and the, so the, and the 550 schools that you'll be at next year are those all in Minnesota? Those are all Minnesota schools. Yep. Okay. So it's across 37 or 38 different school districts, and it would be open to every school in all of those districts. Right. And sort of looking ahead, I mean, how many schools do you think you'll get to in the next three years? Yeah. Well, so our goal and really what we're striving uh, forwards to forward towards and are staffing up actually as we speak. I was just working on the job description before I came over here, but um, is really connecting with all the other backpack programs or weekend food programs in the state of Minnesota. Um, so there's um, none of them are as, as large as we are, but there's ones in different parts of the state and connecting with them, learning from them, offering whatever learnings and uh, teachings we might be able to offer even food sourcing potentially, and just kind of tracking what's going on in the state. Where are, where are there existing programs? Where are there gaps? And, you know, kind of prioritizing those gaps. And the real, the goal of that is to, by 2027, um, sorry, 2028, is to have a weekend food program offered to every school in the state of Minnesota. Um, so if they want one, they have a weekend food program and, um, closing that weekend food gap across the state, um, not just through our organization, but through other organizations that are, you know, they have the relationship in Mankato or something, um, and there it makes sense for them to keep going, and there's no reason like for us to take it over or anything. It's really about those kids and getting them a good, solid, um, nutritious food for them to take home for the weekends. Right, that is that is awesome. So so again, so going back to the to the beginning. And a lot of what you what you're still doing today is the backpack program, yep, yep. right? So, where you know on Fridays you, you go and put some food in, in the backpacks yep. of the kids who you know are going to be short of food, you know, through the weekend. Do, do you do anything else other than the back than the backpack program? 
Yeah, so the backpack program, we call it a weekend food program because they used to be actual physical backpacks that people would provide separate from the kids' current backpacks, and that's not a very discreet way to give food to kids. Um, so we say weekend food to kind of just, uh, to kind of st- uh, st- to delineate across those yep. that idea of what the programs are like. But yeah, it's a backpack program, weekend food program. And uh, we have some produce programs in the summer. We call it Grow and Give. Um, so we have a garden. There's a few other community gardens in the in the Twin Cities. They're about 6,000 square feet or so each. And we collect that produce and give it out to kids at Head Start programs, which is you know, typically lower income kids, and then also in partnership with the Roseville Public Schools. That's where our warehouse and, and office is located, is in the city of Roseville here in Minnesota. And um, that's probably our biggest uh, other program. Uh, we also utilize our bags in other ways other than just, our bags of food, um, meal bags in other ways just than just the weekend food program in other, you know, programs that might have kids that are a main part of their program. So think like a summer YMCA um, kids program, yep. serving a lot of lower income kids so that they can have food in the summers. Uh, we do a summer programming where we partner with, there are some schools open in the summers, so we do our, our backpack program there, but then also um, you know, parks and rec and libraries and those kinds of things where the kids are, are located. Because again, it's a, it's a logistics problem. So the, that part of the problem is finding where the kids are so they right. can get them the food. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, it's such a, an amazing program, and you, you're impacting, you know, so many kids, and of course, the number of kids and people that are being impacted is, is increasing every year, like, mm-hmm. dramatically, which, yeah. is, which, is, which is so impressive. But I'm guessing, you know, along the way, it hasn't, it hasn't always been easy. No. So, so, I mean, you know, can you, th- if you think back, you know, what were some of the challenges you had in the early days to sort of get your distribution up and running? For sure. Well, I mean, I, first of all, I wasn't a nonprofit professional. I didn't know how to run a nonprofit. I barely knew how nonprofits worked. I didn't know what overhead was or any of that stuff. So there was a lot for me to learn. Um, we hired our first or second employee, a first employer other than myself in 2015. Um, so there was a good one and a half, two years there before we had someone else on board. Um, and I mean, a lot of it is, you know, it's not the same as moving a shipping container on a train across the country, turns out. Um, it's a lot more specific. Um, we put in, you know, as we hired, you know, experts in logistics that were much more experts than I was, we put in tracking um, of our drivers. We have warehouse barcoding and specific menus and uh, someone that just buys the food. We, we buy almost all the food we provide. Um, we have a dietitian on staff that makes sure the food has a good nutritional quality and value. Um, but it's just a, there's a lot of moving parts. It's at its, at its base, it's still very simple. We're buying food, putting it in a bag and getting, getting it to the kids. But there's a lot more involved in that, in the scale that we're at. Right. Right. So, um, you know, scale is a big component of that. It's not that hard to buy food for 27 kids and put it in a bag. Um, it gets a lot more complicated when there's 10,000 kids or 15,000 or more. Um, and that's why you have to hire good people that are smarter. At least right. that's what I did. Yes. I hire good people that I, were smarter I, than I, me. So. I, I agree completely. I mean, again, when, you, when you're scaling any organization, you know, people is going to be the first place you've got to yeah. do that. Yep. And I guess we'll, we'll get into other ways to scale maybe in a little bit yeah. too. But one, one of the things that was so impressive at the, so in the, at the recent open house that you did that we were all able to yeah. attend was you know, also looking more specifically around the different types of food that you're delivering to different communities based on their, on their ethnic or religious you know, uh, situations. Yep. And, and again, how that further complicates the logistics because, again, you want to make sure you're delivering the right types of food to the right types of people, yeah. that, they're, that, that, that it's the kind of food that they're comfortable with and that they want to, want to eat. So can you tell us a little bit more about like how how, com- how complicated is that uh, with the different <laughs> types of food and, and, the, and, the, and the different diets that are ready that people need? Yeah, for sure. So we the food we provide, or I would say everything we do is only as good as the food that we provide to the kids and families. So um, 
it doesn't matter how good our logistics is if the food gets home and it tastes bad and the kids don't eat it or if they eat it it has no nutritional value it's, it's only as good as what that what is in that meal bag and, and we and, and, and i mean is that a, is that a metric that you it's not a, it's not really a metric but you say that that is at the end of the day if if the food is not good and it's not going to be eaten then nothing else matters it's just is, a waste of time yeah so is that yep. something that is that it, that kind of guides your team every day for sure yeah and so we yeah we focus on one of our sort of mantras is what's best for the kids and how does that affect that that should influence all of our decisions um, so you know if we which is why we do taste tests of the food, which is why we make sure there's a nutritional value. Um, we ha there are metrics of you know pounds and bags and sites and all that stuff, which only doesn't mean anything unless what you're actually doing programmatically. Or that's all. That's all. The food. Yeah, that's all secondary. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the all of that exists for that moment when the kid gets the food. Yeah. So if that moment when the kid gets the food, that food's bad for right. whatever bad is, they're not gonna. It's not gonna be as helpful to them. Yeah then all of it's, there's no reason to do the other things sure. because those are all there for that moment. Yeah, um, yeah so we provide what we, would, what we say is good food, um, which we define as nutritious, delicious, and relevant. So nutritious, that it, we have a dietitian on staff that I mentioned, so she tracks all these complicated nutritional things that I didn't even know existed. Um, and then uh, nutritious, delicious, so we want it to taste good, right? So if the kids have something really nutritious, but they don't eat it, then that's not that helpful. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so we do taste tests and uh, buy only certain brands of our food. We have a, uh, again, we buy 99% of our food so that we can track that nutritional value and that delicious value. Um, and that's all tracked in our in our logistics system um, on, the, on, the, on the item of food and then the brand and, or the source, I should say, because they switch brands sometimes, even though it's the same thing. Right. And, um, you know, that's the sort of a quality rating of that food. And then you mentioned what we would say is relevancy. So the nutritious, delicious, and relevant. So if the food gets home to a kid, but um, say they're a recent immigrant and they don't understand what mac and cheese is or something, so they won't eat it, then that's not that helpful, right? It's just a, right. It's just a box that they don't know what to do with. Yeah. So the relevancy of having food that the kids and families are used to and that they are, you know, know how to prepare and are normal parts of their diet is a, is a big component or effort of ours. So there's that cultural relevancy, but then there's also situational relevancy. So if the kid, say, they're um, couch hopping, their family's couch hopping, or they're in a, you know, homeless or transient or mobile situation, giving them a bag of dried rice isn't helpful because they right. don't have access no to a to kitchen. It. Yeah, they're not gonna, they don't have time to cook or a place to cook that. Um, so then we also have a bag type where it's more like ready to eat food um, where you don't need a kitchen to prep the food. Um, but at the same time, another fam, say, you know, a Latino family might really want the rice and that's really great for them. And so that relevancy is, you know, those two families side by side in different situations, it's not, it's not equal. So we, right. I say every meal isn't equal. Yeah. Um, so when we track the pounds, you know, I could give out a whole bunch of, you know, ramen noodles or something and track all that and it would be super cheap, really inexpensive um, and almost no nutritional value, but we could do a lot more. Sure. But that more is only as good as the food. As I mentioned, it's only as good as the, the food. The nutritional value here. at the end of yep. the day. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, that's... That that is so amazing that you have you know not only are you doing this incredible work but you're you're making sure that that the recipients of of the food are really enjoying it and that, that of obviously then makes them even more grateful. So back to the you know how you've scaled. I, I, it's one of the stories that I heard at the open house mm -hmm. was how prior to COVID you were you were delivering about five thousand meals a week. Yeah. Yep. So we're doing about 5,000 to 6,000 meal bags a week. And then uh, COVID hit in um, March of 2020. This feels like so long ago. Wow. Um, and the schools closed in three days. 
Right. The governor announced it on a Sunday, March, I think it was March 15th, and they had to be closed by Thursday. Most of them didn't even open again. And so immediately that the for food access for low income kids, the biggest source of that food or nutritional access is those meal lunches at school. Right. Um, or those meals at school, lunches, some brec or breakfast now is a big big um, thing, snacks, and even some opportunity for some dinners here and there, depending on different qualifications. And that was removed from them overnight. almost overnight. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. And so and schools aren't set up to be home delivery food programs, or they weren't. You know, they were, uh, there was a big movement to doing more fresh food on site and not doing the, you know, TV dinner kind of thing that, that was super big in the you know 80s and 90s, right. and you know so the food quality at a lot of the schools was significantly improving, um, and they had salad bars and all this great food at the school. And then all of a sudden, can't come to the school anymore, so they and they had to try and switch over. And um, they did the school districts uh, have and the staff there have done amazing doing the all they can to get that to work. Um, but part of our role was we are made to do that for that delivery or distribution to the kids in a in a way they, they can take the food home. And so we stepped up in a big way, providing um, about 25,000 meal bags. Uh, so I don't know what that math is, four times, right? Four times more. Four times, yeah. Uh, basically the next week. And um, wow. what we did in the next three weeks is essentially empty our warehouse of all the meals that we had and ended up in um, that school year doing about 2.7 million meals, um, which is different than meal bags, so it gets a little confusing. So each bag has more than one meal in it, but mm -hmm. um, we did over, so as far as meal bags, we did over 600,000 meal bags that went out to the kids in wow. school year 2019, 2020. Yeah. And then same last year, so the 2020, 20, so 20, 20, the 2020 and 2021 school year, we also did about 550,000 meal bags that actually went out to the kids. Which is, and, and compared to 2019, that was a huge increase. Before that, it was not that many. Uh, like, um, if I do the math in my head, around like 180,000 Okay, so Bags yeah, so, so yeah, so four to five times more. Yeah, meals. yeah, yeah. And it, and so and and so, how did you suddenly come up with with four times the volume of of food? Well, we luckily so that December, right before COVID, you know, everything closed in March, we had just finished and then started tweaking our our um, investment in our inventory system, which includes um, demand planning of the food menus. So. Normally, in the past, we'd have a spreadsheet. And now when I think about it, I was like, how did we do anything with spreadsheets only? Uh, but we had a spreadsheet, and you know, we're going to make these, food, these meals, these bags. We're going to assemble these bags. And so we need this food, and we've got two weeks to get it here, um, which is crazy. And it doesn't really give you the opportunity to certainly um, you know, get the best prices or kind of wheel and deal a little mm -hmm. bit with the vendors. Certainly doesn't allow you to buy in bulk because we're not looking four weeks ahead. We're just looking two weeks ahead. So in four weeks, we might need the same stuff, right. but we're not thinking about that yet because it's it's a spreadsheet. It doesn't. Yeah. It's we want it to think for us, not sure. for us to have to th to do the thinking. So, right. Right. Um, investing in NetSuite is our logistic system um, and financial system, and that. So we put in demand planning, warehouse management, so barcoding and. Uh, bins in the warehouse and everything. We have um, delivery routing. So one, the routes actually, there's the system that tells you where to go or what deliveries to do in what order and based on traffic and everything. Um, and then tracking the drivers and everything. So we had just put that into place in December. Oh, and then we're like tweaking right. it January, February. And that was huge. I, we would not have... Been able to do that otherwise. Yeah, I don't even know what we would have how we would have been able to handle that. So, um, you know, and we have one of our, one of our, our, um, values is relationships and the, the importance of building those and retaining those and investing in those. And that was a huge in that moment where, 
it was sort of a whole, all hands on deck. You know, we called Penske, who was where we lease our trucks, and we're like, we can we have a truck for a month for free? And and they gave us a truck for a month for free. Um, we That's got awesome. extra pallet jacks from people and all kinds. Of, you know, the the community really rallied to be able to respond to that need with, you know, all of a sudden we needed more equipment, right? right? So right, right. as well as food. So we're buying food and then we need more storage space. So the company that was moving down the road had some warehouse space and the Mall of America gave us the second floor of the old Bloomingdale's to store food. Um, so it was, yeah. you know, this the infrastructure scale was not planned and, sure. and you know, we couldn't just buy a building or something. So, yeah. um, so you mean, so you had a lot of help, but obviously your team, obviously they stepped up big time. Oh yeah. Because they had to, I mean, they, they had to do essentially produce four times the amount of food yep. with a lot of great help and, and donations and what have you from the community, Absolutely. whether it, whether it was trucks or storage space or whatever. But I mean, your team, obviously, they stepped up, did a lot of extra hours. But I guess this is where you were you're talking about the systems that you put in place. Obviously, without those, you wouldn't have been able to, you know, get people to work yeah you know 32 hours a day well they would have been working a lot they just would have probably been um doing more work than they needed to do right because right. we wouldn't have known that we needed to do this there tomorrow and so they you know you'd go deliver next door right. because you didn't, you didn't yeah, pay attention to it right yeah and so i mean our team this is really where the sort of other duties as a sign comes in or um you know we're we're a we're a team and sometimes you do stuff across departments and I mean, everyone was doing felt like everything. everything. So, right. you know, people were delivering food in the van that weren't drivers or logistics people at all. There were people running volunteer events. There was, we were all out there, you know, cleaning everything with disinfectant spray and every day. And, sure. um, yeah, I mean, I think our team is our, our leadership team and everyone else, you know, on our whole team is amazing. And, you know, to work at a nonprofit, which is, you know, less pay and all that, all the, you know, you could probably make more if you go to businesses. So the, the sort of mantra is, well, you must really care about the mission, which they do for sure. And that's in general accurate, but to really see that in play mm -hmm. and there's no other reason that you're here, you know, on a Friday night at 11, other than you care about the mission because, right. Like, you don't have to be here. We told, you know, we were like, this is optional. Th those kinds of things where it's like, we have to do this. We have to switch the whole warehouse around in a day because we need more space or whatever. And um, really seeing the team step up into those role, into those tasks, I would say, or roles that were nothing that they were, a lot of times, nothing that they were hired for. Right, And it was right. just like, well, you can't, you can't go out to the schools anymore, so now can you do this? And really just stepping up and the amazing, um, cause we had to, we had to manufacture all those bags too. Right. Like we Put them all built together. them. Yeah. Right. So yeah. assemble them and everything. So that was a huge volunteer effort and staff effort and everything as well. Right. In the middle of a pandemic when you shouldn't congregate, like there's just lots of complications. Yes. <laughs> no, I, I mean, it's, it's incredible what you, what you managed to do, you know, where you're, you're, you're growing exponentially because of the, the need, but then you also have all these additional challenges, because of COVID, but also not having space, not having sufficient trucks, et cetera, et cetera. So, but, and then you, you know, you had people doing double duty, doing things that they shouldn't have been doing, but, I, but I'm guessing now, you know, a year later or a year and a half later, you've, you again, you've, you've organized things and you've got more systems in place and that, which is, which is also, you know, how we ended up meeting Yeah, was because as you're, as you're looking to scale your systems, because there's only so much that, that people can do at the end of the day. And if you want to continue to scale, you obviously need to start creating some systems. And that, in, that includes, which was really interesting to see in your, in your warehouse with, you know, the, the automatic pallet wrapper yep. and things like that. And, and of course, the, what, what you refer to as the, the barcoding system, it's, it's clearly a lot more than just <laughs> a barcoding system. You scan stuff. You I scan, don't know how to use it. Anymore. Right, exactly. I used to know. But then of course, on, on the sort of the things that you don't see, which is the technology that we that we work mm -hmm. on, you know, is is how, how do you, you know, integrate all the technology that runs the, the, the team, yeah. runs the people, runs the systems. So you 
well, you, I guess, got to a point where whatever whatever technology we're using before, you know, from a, what we what we typically recall, refer to as you know marketing and sales technology, yep. CRM, CRM of, etc. You know, you'd because of your growth, you'd outgrown what you were using before, and and then you some you know somehow we connected and now we're we're working together, yeah. which we of course are very happy about. And how do you how do you feel that that technology is going to help you to continue to to scale on the numbers that you you shared earlier? Where I mean, you just you know to go from from three hundred and fifty to five hundred and fifty schools just in the next year that that is already that's the kind of growth that that any for profit business would mm-hmm. want want to see. Never mind you know non profit growing at that speed. Yeah. So what is so what is the the technology that you think you will continue to to keep using, and how do you think about technology? making you more efficient yeah well i mean i think if you um you know any organization well our organization put in place a lot of technologies to solve problems on their face right so well we need to email people okay let's get mailchimp well we need to track all the donors okay let's get let's do this oh we need to um be able to post on different social medias okay well let's get this right um, and we need, want to send a video. Okay, this is so there's, you know, I don't know. It's, I would there's at least six or seven different systems that we're consolidating into HubSpot. So if you think of it like a dam, a water dam, right? And you're like, oh, well, we, there's a hole, and then here's a hole, and at some point you have all your fingers, and you're like, you oh, I fingers, should probably yeah. come up with a better overall solution so that there's I don't even need to be here anymore. Sure. Um, and that's really where HubSpot came in. Um, and we did an extensive search of all the big people, big different systems. Software options. Yeah. 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 And not that it, the other ones are bad or whatever, but this worked best for our, our needs and we're really excited about it. Um, and your team's, it's been great to work with your team, a little plug. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, here at Dynamico. Um, right. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and I would say, you know, and I actually told this to um, your wife, I think, that the reason we chose, we chose the software because it was the right software or system for us. Mm-hmm. Um, the reason we chose Dynamico is because, and I, every vendor I've ever used tells us they're on board with our mission. Like they have, it's a nonprofit. They have to, they know the, they know the sales pitch. Mm-hmm. Um, most of them don't actually, and I'm pretty good at telling the difference. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's fine. They don't have to necessarily to do a good job. Um, but the reason that we chose Dynamico is that it was very um, clear what the that you're at, uh, that you're that you shared our mission um, and the value of it in our community and um, not that that necessarily changes your work or sure. the skill that your staff or team brings um, but that relational component or partnership component was just huge for us because it it you know it does in the end make a difference probably it, it yeah, yeah you're more caring about figuring out what processes we need and that kind of thing and so you know that was the big selling point for us everybody yeah, yeah. um but yeah so the systems i mean if you like i said before like you don't you want the system to think for you so that you can do the parts you need to do so in the case of like engaging with a donor for instance we had you know the email system a video system a a donation tracking system, a um, the social media system, and none of them talk to each other at all. Um, I guess the email one did with the donor database, but sort of. And so, what I what if I were I couldn't see if I went at, it went into our donor system and said, "Show me, you know, Joe Schmo's history with us. What are they interested in? How have they engaged with us?" I, I wouldn't have that. So I'd have to go into the email and try and find them if they're in there and be like, oh, it turns out you didn't click the thing. No one actually, there's not even in our, they're not getting our emails for the last four years because no one knew that. Like they just didn't get over there right. and those kind of things. So making it so I, it's clearly understanding, um, you know, what are the interests of the donors who are interested? And it's like, we've been mailing this person for seven years. They've never replied and never opened any of our emails. Maybe we should like leave them alone. Right. right, right. Um, and that's really the big thing for us is really being able to engage with our, what we would say, constituents, or because they're not really customers for us. Sure. Yeah. Um, our constituents, our contacts, our volunteers, our donors, our um, 
partner organizations that we work with, and yeah, it's really hard to do that when you and don't know who they are. Right, and they, and they will have different needs, and and you know, so if with our with our with our for profit clients, you, you know, we of course we we call that customer experience. Yep. In in your in your case, it's just it it really is just you know communication with your with your donor base and and every other stakeholder who will impact your business you know one way or another. And if you don't have an integrated system where the data from from everything that they're doing flows into one what we call you know single source of truth, which is kind of at the center of, of why we do what we do with it's not about HubSpot or, or or any software. It's about having all your technology integrated so that all the, the data from your constituents or or customers in the case of a nonprofit or for profit that they all go into one place that you're able to make better faster yeah. decisions and communicate with them in a way yeah. that they feel like they, they need to be communicated with yeah and there's I mean there's always and that takes a commitment to do that right financially staff time headache of thinking about how the you know internal IDs transfer whatever sure, sure. Um, that's that's why we have you guys um, but, you know, no, I don't know, if maybe, I feel like no company probably once or organization starts and has all their software needs in place right. for the next 10 years or Absolutely. two years. Yeah. And I mean, if they do, great. But at some point it's like, okay, this is a mess. It, it, we didn't, everything was working. There wasn't like a red flag or a big problem. Sure. We've, it was sort of functional, but you know, there's mistakes here and there. Like people aren't in the email list or, um, someone asked not to get mail anymore, but we marked it in one and not the other one and things like that, where, um, it really just ends up taking more time than it would to just be commit to it. And, and you have to find the right timing. And sometimes, you know, yeah. I'm not an expert on timing of, of transitions which you guys you guys are much more than I am um but yeah. at some point you just got to do it right and yeah it costs money but in the it's cheaper in the long run easily um so it's really just more upfront and you just save and sure like, you could hire a whole other staff person for some of this stuff and yeah well you have the savings get the fat fingers you know with the right, exactly. bad data and everything yeah. so. so you have the the savings on the one the, on the one hand but you also have the addi additional opportunities for revenue because because you're yeah. you're giving people what they want when they want it. Yeah, you know. so you have the top line and the bottom line, right? right. So um, you've got your inbound inbound marketing and whatever, um, and just increased presence and time uh, and knowledge of what's going on and getting people in, bringing them into the family, if you will. Right. Um, and then navigating them through the process. So if someone signs up right now, pre pre HubSpot which HubSpot isn't up and running yet. If someone signs up for an email list, then they're just on our email list. That right. I don't think they even get like a thanks for joining our email list right. <laughs> email. Right. Yeah. Um, which isn't really nice of us, right? Sure. And certainly isn't going we're not moving them towards you know other ways to get further involved, right. yeah. which is where that top line comes yeah. from. But and this is a, and that's a very common challenge, right? And it's and and this in in many facets of life, you know, we all very familiar with the term if it ain't broke then don't fix it yeah but it, it comes there comes a point where it is it does feel broken and and then that's time to fix it right? well it's that you none of it's broken but it's five different bikes right, right. You're like well all the bikes work they just don't work together and you're like well you just need i lost the analogy a car or something yeah, i don't know yeah. something better that works right. puts them all together yeah yeah um, but i mean yeah. but i think from from what i'm hearing in, in, in that in your particular situation the the part that was was broken was if you feel like you're emailing somebody who doesn't want to be emailed or you're not emailing somebody who who does need to be emailed so that you can continue to grow at the pace that you're trying to grow that's a problem and that and that needs to be fixed yeah you know? i mean so. we'd have people gave us well, how much of this i should share people would give us like five or ten grand and we sent them a receipt but but no thank you yeah and yeah. it's just we never i never saw it the right people didn't see it um it's just in a list of 20,000 names in a 
right. basically online spreadsheet is what our old donor yeah. database was. But of course, when you're and when you're growing at that pace, you know those kind of things fall through the cracks, yeah. and but eventually you've got to you've got yeah. to fix them and. Because exactly. they will, because what we what we call, you know, we talk about the. I think you and I talked about the flywheel concept, which is another, you know, HubSpot yep. uh, concept, where, you know, those things create fric friction in your f your flywheel, and your flywheel is what makes your business or your organization grow more predictably, you know, more efficiently, more more easily, yeah. and those kinds of things they they add friction to your your flywheel, and your flywheel is essentially, in your case, your constituents. How how they feel about their relationship with with your brand, yeah. and if if they feel like it's sticky or or there are sharp edges or whatever, that's a problem. Yeah. And you and it, until you fix it, your flywheel is not going to spin any faster. Yeah, and for us, the again the problem with all, any of that not working or the flywheel being unbalanced or sticky or constituents not donating to us again or a school partner feeling neglected because we never said thank you when we obviously should have or all those things is that less kids get food yes and that's always your, your sort of, yeah so your it's not sales income. numbers for us there's a revenue there's top of bottom line but the 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 revenue and expenses what's in there is purchasing food and getting that food to the kids and yeah. so the more expenses we spend on you know try on these seven different systems or staff time we spend on that could be spent on getting food or engaging with with partners at, uh, at a school or something, um, right. and so it's, I mean it's mission critical. It's if it's a you know for profit, it's it's business critical. These are mm -hmm. um, you know core assets of the organization, and it's a lot harder to get new donors. And I'm guessing it's a lot harder to get new customers than it is to get to retain them. Yeah. Um, Although what's what's interesting though is you know with you know working with both nonprofits and for profits, it's it's interesting to see how so many more for profits are starting to think more like non profits yeah. versus the other way around. I mean, so you have a for profit background and you've you've put that to incredible work at every meal. But the from a from a communication perspective, a lot a lot more for profits are starting to think more like non profits about how they take care of their yeah. constituents, even though they call them customers. Right. Which is in, which is an interesting development and and I and a lot of people compare it to you know how 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 the Europeans are different to the Americans kind of mm -hmm. thing. It, it they, it's it's more that sort of nonprofit way of thinking where is you know in in the U.S. things are a little more you know it's more based on money you know historically yeah. but that's starting to change because for profit businesses have realized that you know if you don't give people what they want yeah. then that's then things start start breaking down and start slowing yeah. you it's down. It's brand loyalty, right and. Um, I mean, I think I don't know as much about how businesses work in, in Europe and that, but what I see a lot in America business is the like one and done sale. Yeah. And it's not a lot. There's no long term hope even necessarily. Right. And it's just like we're selling this thing and next month we're selling another thing. Yeah. And, you know, we have a list, but, you know, it's really about the clickbait on Facebook. Right, I don't know. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, no, and I'm fact, out of that field now. But. Right. Yeah. <laughs> no. And and I think we'll probably I'll probably add that graphic to to the show notes for the, for this episode, which is you know the that where the customer is the afterthought is the is the typical mm -hmm. you know sales funnel, right? Yeah. You you know marketing does one does their thing and then sales does their thing and you end up with a customer plopping out the bottom of the funnel, yep. and then they go back and try and find the next customer, yep. but they forget about the one that they just created, which is where all the value is yeah and that's and like the moves management and, and right. that kind of thing yeah. yeah and that's and that's you know so in 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 the hubspot ecosystem we talk about the fact that the you know the funnel is is dead mm -hmm. and we, we we have to think about the, the flywheel because the center of the flywheel is the customer or the constituent and 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 your organization moves around them yeah for sure so that's a, I'm, gra I'm glad you mentioned that because i'm going to add that to the to the show notes and then yeah and then thanks also for your you know for what you said earlier about you know working you know how you like how you de decided to work with us in addition in addition to HubSpot because it's, I think a lot of people well there's there are two things there and you know I didn't want to say anything when we first started talking to every meal because you know I'm a, I'm a member of the Minneapolis Rotary Club mm -hmm. and last summer because we were we had to cancel our meetings because yep. of because of COVID 
but we had we all pay every month to to have or every week so we pay monthly to have meals every week yep. during our our meetings but of course we weren't having our meetings and we we got together and said well what are we going to do with the money that otherwise would otherwise would have got for lunch and somehow we connected with with you yep. and and you actually you know came and spoke to our rotary club but i didn't i didn't want to make that connection until yeah. until because i didn't want that to kind of muddy the waters as sure. it were yep. but i'm i'm glad that it, that it, that it worked out because yeah. you know i saw what you were doing through that through my rotary experience and what we how we were able to do our little bit through the rotary club to help you last summer by diverting those funds from our own lunches to yeah. to the to the kids which is huge and that's what i was saying like in the middle of this pandemic you you all could have just said, well, then I don't have to pay for breakfast or lunch. Right, right. And and gone on with your business, but someone said, uh, you know, on with your life. And but someone said, hey, what about how can we make a difference with this? Yeah. And so and again, your your timing obviously was well because you would. I mean, you needed to come up with a solution. Yeah. So you obviously reached out to all kinds of organizations, and you, you've already mentioned some of them. And we were, you know, fortunate to be to be one of those, and we were. You know, able to pivot really easily yeah. and divert those those funds, and we were really happy that we did. But then the other thing that you mentioned was the, you know, how you decided on 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 HubSpot, but then you also realized that well, which is which is still a, a huge misunderstanding for for any organization, for many organizations, is that you know the software is just one part of the solution. We we like to say it's about a tenth of the solution. Mm -hmm. The the other ninety percent is is how you actually build that system so that it does right. what your particular organization needs it to do. Right. And there's a there's a there's still a lot of misunderstanding about well, well why don't we just buy HubSpot and we'll plug it in and upload and, our data and, it's fine. and we'll get all the, yeah. the benefits. But you know the reason that HubSpot started the their partner program you know almost ten years ago now was because they realized that. If they had people who knew HubSpot really well implementing it for for their customers, you know, businesses and and, and nonprofits, it would be far more successful, and they would keep those customers for a lot longer. Yeah. And it's, so it's been a an, you know a great opportunity for us. But there's there's a huge value yeah. add that we bring to to our clients who are then also you know yeah, HubSpot customers. For sure. Yeah. Well, I mean that's where those one off. Well, you know, those five bikes or whatever our analogy is of the five different systems. I think we had seven that combined into HubSpot. You know, I can set up MailChimp because all it does is email. Right. Basically. I mean, it does other stuff, but those one off ones that only do one thing and don't talk to each other. Yeah, you can set it up yourself for the most part. Right. Because they're simple and do one thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's if you can set it up yourself, it's probably not really worth this consolidation effort or money because it's yep. not consolidating. You can't, I mean, you, I guess maybe you have a HubSpot expert on staff or something. I don't, so there's always exceptions, yeah. but for the most part, like if you wanted to do, if you wanted to be powerful, like it can be, um, you have to have people who know how to set up the powerfulness of it. Yeah. And right. You know, the in intricacies and, you know, we have different, we have a unique way of how we engage with our school and, and partners and, you know, how do we track that in, in a way that will work in five years from now and in a way that also tells us that if someone works at this school, you know, but also is a donor and a volunteer, you know, and gets this email, like, how do we know that's even the same person? Right. Right. So versus, you know, I call a donor, I'm like, thanks for your gift. How did you hear about us? And they're like, oh, well, I work at Sheridan school and you're like, Oh, you know, you know, I've, I've, fallen, I've worked at the school for 20, whatever, 10 yeah. years and you've been doing it since we started. And like, and not, not that that solves all those problems, but, um, certainly higher visibility to what people are doing and being able to understand more of who our constituents or customers are and how to engage them in the ways they want or leave them alone or whatever. Um, I mean, that's a big, that's, that's what we do so we can feed the kids. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, and of course, then the other thing is that we all know that, you know, if you think back five years, the technology that that, that you could have used and that was available at, at that time is very different to what's available now. Right. And in five years, it's going it's to be different again. You know, sure. it continues to evolve. And we were actually talking about it earlier, right, how 
I mean, we, we both kind of like what evolution does, yep. you know, for us. And well, it, that was about sleeping in beds and well, not the floor. Well, exactly, <laughs> right. But I think there's a, there's a lot of similarities in, in evolution of for all sure. kinds. And we all know that from a, from a technology perspective, you know, the opportunities that technology brings, obviously there are some some dark sides to that as well if you, if you let that happen. But we're obviously, we're focused on using technology the same way that technology, if you go back a hundred years or a thousand years, whether with you know whether it was you know going from the Stone Age to the Iron Age, I mean that was technology. Yeah. Um, it, it, we, 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 we adopted it as, as humans because it made our lives better and easier yeah. and we'll continue to do that. We don't, we don't have to, but we choose to do that. Yeah. And that's, and that's again, that's a big part of what we believe. And we also believe that the complexity of technology, I mean, it's been ridiculous for the last, how it's changed yeah. in the last 20 years, but it's not gonna slow down. Right. And we need to be there to stay, to stay ahead of it because we, we know that the, the, the businesses and, and, and organizations that are our clients, they, they just, it doesn't make, there's no way for them to be able to keep up with that. You know, so we are sort of their eyes and ears keeping up with the changes sure. in technology so that when they need to, a problem solved, we can we can yeah. bring in the technology solution because we know what's working today. For sure. Yep. Exactly. Awesome. So Rob, you know, thanks again so much. I'm gonna I wanna sort of end with one question that's that's not necessarily related to either every meal or or us. Sure. And that is um, what what is what are your what are your what is your favorite hobby outside of work? Ooh. Um, I'm a bit of a handyman, so I like to, um, fix things and I finished our kitchen and my sister's kitchen and my mom's kitchen. Oh, wow. I make them buy me the tools is how it works. Okay. So I have, so then I get a lot of nice tools. It's like, well, if you paid someone to tile your floor, you probably have to pay them like five grand. So all I want is this $150 saw. (laughs) So it's a good deal for them. Um, but that's sort of my side thing. Um, Do you have a, like a handyman.com kind of where people can get hold of you? No. I don't know. <laughs> no, it's a, it's not a, it's not a no, paid no, handyman. No. I'm right. not yeah. good enough for that. But um, yeah, so that's and I've got two kids. I've got a four year old and a seven year old, and so um, you know, playing with them and rolling around and trying not to get too hurt on the floor with them because right. they're pretty rambunctious. But awesome. So you're a, so you're a handy a handy guy. Yeah, I mean, you watch YouTube videos enough that yeah. you learn how to do stuff. So <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. And then, uh, Rob, did you have any other questions for for me in closing? I don't think so. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and to share some, and um, I appreciate the work that your team's doing with my team um, and with the setting up the HubSpot, and that is already impressive. And I'm looking forward to being fully implemented and up and running um, in like a month now. I think. And yeah. yeah, it's just fun to be here and tell, share some about the Every Meal story and what we're doing. If if listeners or viewers want to learn more, they can go to everymeal.org. Um, we also have Facebook and Instagram and those kind of things for those so inclined. Right. Um, yeah. But yeah. And yeah, and we'll be adding those links as well in cool. in, in the show notes. And you know, again, from from my side, you know. You know, it's you know, every meal is one of the one of the most incredible organizations that I've come across. So I I urge you to to go out there and, and check them out and, and see the amazing work that you've that they're doing that they're doing and that you've just heard Rob talk about. You know, the, the the fact that you can impact you know thousands of kids and this is just in 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 one state currently. But I think you're what you're probably doing at the same time is is creating a model for for other you know organizations in other sure, states yeah. to to do similar things. So I think the, the the power and the value of what you're doing is going you know will go way beyond what you think you're currently doing, which is which is awesome. So thank you for that. Yeah, we hope to continue to evolve and impact more kids as well. Yeah, I have a feeling you might do that. <laughs> yeah, Rob. So thanks again. Yep. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Absolutely. Thank you for checking out this episode of RevOps Champions. This show is powered by Dynamico, a HubSpot consulting firm 
helping businesses level up the technology systems that power their ability to scale. If you enjoyed what you learned in this episode, make sure to follow RevOps Champions wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Or visit RevOpsChampions.com to get immediate access to all of the latest episodes.